All right, good afternoon. Who wants to start early and finish early? All right, this is like the last stretch of the conference, right? Good. So um, we're going to make it uh, pretty, pretty fast. Um, so we'll start off with the introduction. So I'm Henri Vandenbalk. Um, so this is a talk with Charles Schwab. So I was actually with Charles Schwab about a couple of weeks ago. Um, Jacob actually asked me, like, hey, we need to submit this paper, and do you want to co-present? I said, sure. Then I switched companies and now I work for Pivot, Pivotal. Um, so it still all says Schwab, but um, uh, Jago, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, he, he kept calling me Jago. Um, for the last 20 years of my career, everybody's called me Jago, but it is Jason Go. Um, I'm a technical director for Charles Schwab, uh, one of their larger organizations called CTS, Core Technology Solutions. Um, I primarily function as a solutions architect within our client solutions reporting technology, um, mostly focusing on our Schwab charitable platform. So. Great. Um, so thanks for coming. I know this is towards the, towards the end, so we'll try to make it entertaining. Um, just kind of a quick show of hands. Anybody have seen distributed systems around the conference this week? Yeah. <laughs> There'll be Kubernetes here, and like CF, right, CF Summit. Anybody talk about data by any chance? A little bit, right? So we talked about the easy stuff. Now let's talk a little bit yeah. about the hard stuff. Because yeah. um, this is easy. I see if push, right? You got a new application. Easy, scaled up. So, but before we start, um, here's some inspiration. Um, if you haven't looked at these books, I highly recommend them. Uh, the one I'll, I'll point out uh, specifically is Designing Data, uh, data Intense Applications. If you really want to know the fundamentals, of distributed systems, specifically around the data, read this book. It is fantastic. It just lays it out very good. So some of the things that we're going to be talking about today is specifically around the data side in distributed systems. Um, um, I love distributed systems. I've got a background in distributed systems, um, but we always forget about the data side. So we're going to talk about a couple of different principles and concerns that you have to address and you be aware of. We're not going to give you prescribed solutions here. Um, specifically because we submitted this for an hour and we got half hour, so I didn't want to compress all of them. But I'm going to give you a couple things that you need to consider when you design your systems um, to go through. Because don't just walk into it like, hey, I want to create a distributed system, active, active, it's all cool, right? There's things you need to make sure you, you handle in your system. So why don't we get started? So first, definition-wise, um, this is very high level. Uh, we've all seen Centralized, centralized systems, right? They tend to be like a single database, everything is all together, and we might have even have some microservices around it, but it's still with, with one database. So they tend to be optimized primarily for central management, central control, right? It's all close together. Or even classically, the cost of storage, um, we wanted to have them together, close, close affinity. Um, but on the other side, we want to move to a decentralized model. Now, why do we want to move to a decentralized model? Well, we've all talked about scaling things up, right? Creating more resiliency. Those things are all good. Um, but you also have to decentralize the data side of the house, right? And so we'll be talking about some, some of the properties. Um, but it's really about separating of concerns, because those concerns are the ones that address things around consistency and scal scalability. Now, a couple of key highlights to, to keep in mind while we go through this. Latency, or the speed of light, is still a problem, right? It doesn't matter how you spin it, it's still a problem, right? You have multiple data centers you have to deal with. And in the centroid model, it was actually fairly easy to deal with this, right? You really only had to deal with the latency between the consumer of the data and the data store itself. In distributed, we're kind of pivoting the latency more now because we need to have replication, um, synchronization, those kind of constructs in place. Latency is now in a difference, so that's why we have things like eventually consistent. Um, the other part is we're partitioning the data more as well, um, so we need to have that as a concern when we're doing it. And another key point to really keep in mind, we'll talk about this, is the read and write patterns and access patterns are different in your systems between them. Okay? So let me give you a couple of specific concerns you're going to have to address. Um, first and foremost, in your system, your access patterns are different. If you have one system that has one access pattern, I'd love to talk to you about that, right? But there's not that many. 
Um, now, there are some edge cases, obviously. For example, like in the trading world, um, you have a lot of read-write read concerns that are, are different, right? You might actually be doing a lot of reading versus actually writing. Or some other systems that are reference data systems, mainly reading. But in general, in a distributed system, your read, access, read and write access patterns are different, right? Your volume, the transactions that you're putting are different. The other part is uh, concern is your functional aspect of it. Functional, we're kind of describing in multiple dimensions, is you have single stack deployments, right? You go from the UI all the way down, or you have some horizontals where you're splitting out the data, the logic, and the UI aspect of it. However you spin it, you want to have some functional aspect of it. And again, the reasons that you're doing these concerns because of complexity, a system becomes complex because if it deals with multiple functions it has to do all at the same time, it becomes a brittle, brittle system. The other one is the storage side. We've been able to do more polyglot type of storage to optimize for the problem that you're trying to solve for. If you're doing basic tabular type of systems, you might still use relationship, or if you need more social network, fraud detection, you might use graph type of storage engines to optimize, right? Um, so it's another concern you have to trade off on. Uh, state is becoming more and more important, not just state inside of your systems, but also on how you uh, persist your state. Uh, classically, we've done you know, tables, we do an update, right? But more and more, we're moving more towards um, true event store type of mechanisms where you have ledgers, and you really are capturing the state transitions, right? So you're pivoting your, your databases upside down, where instead of change data capture, you now that becomes a first class citizen. Like we've known the Kafka's, the event stores of the world. Another key concern that you have to address is actually uh, the scaling, right? Different parts of your system scale differently. Um, like, for example, in the trading world, uh, during market hours, uh, your trade order site uh, might be scaling differently than your fulfillment site, right? That is all different dimensions that are, that are going on in your system. Last but not least is um, fault uh, resiliency. Uh, there's some great patterns around this area. Everybody heard about circuit breaker, bulkheads, fill in the blanks, right? But how do you make your system more resilient? So those are kind of the key concerns that we'll be talking about. But before we go there, if to, you have to understand how did we get here, right? What did we do in the past to get our systems to address these specific concerns? And that's kind of led us to certain architecture as well. So with that, um, Jason is going to go through the history aspect of it. All right, so uh, when we think about the decentralized system that Henri was showing, and we think about the separation of concerns here um, that it achieves, it might be helpful to actually understand that this is not something that happens overnight, as uh, Henri alluded to. Uh, so it, indeed, it is a journey to get there. Um, so, and when we finally get there, it may turn out that that journey isn't actually over just yet. So we're going to start this journey with our monolith. Um, it's a system where um, any or all of your architectural layers are encapsulated within one single component or tier. Um, here we have it represented as just one large rock. Uh, in fact, the word monolith comes from the Greek word monolithos, where monos uh, stands for single or one, and lithos means stone. Now, to help this t tell the story a little bit better, um, let's imagine that this system is one that manages uh, food items. We have red apples and um, yellow bananas and some kind of leafy green there, okay? And generally speaking, we can now start to see some of those layers that I was talking about. So you, at the top here, we have a presentation layer, um, business layer right in the middle, and then also a data layer, okay? But why would we build a system that looks like this? Well, it's simple. It's simple, right? Uh, it's low complexity. It doesn't have a lot of moving parts. All those layers I was talking about is all encapsulated in one single tier, and it's really easy to build. But then we got bored. We took our axe and started breaking down this monolith, and we ended up with two tiers. Um, now, technically, this could be a distributed system. 
But take a look at this client here. It's so fat and loaded and thick. We have the presentation layer in there and also our business rules. Right? We didn't really like that, so over time we started to transition to thinner clients. So what would have cost us to build a system that looked like this? Well, the network happened, right? Um, I still remember back in, I think it was around 93, uh, I was shopping around with my dad, I was probably 15 or 14. Um, we bought some gateway computers from a garage sale. Uh, I had one in my room and I had one downstairs and I still remember running a Cat5 cable from one to the other. Um, in fact, it had to be a crossover cable if you guys remember that. So that's one reason, right? Uh, another reason that we have is the pricing on those machines. They were highly reduced at around that time. Uh, do you guys remember owning Pentiums or even Celerons, right? I still remember owning one of those type of machines. It's dating us. <laughs> A little bit. Um, now comparatively though, if you look at the database side, those things ran on much more powerful hardware. And it could stand to reason as to why these business rules actually start to migrate down to those database tiers. Uh, just to avoid confusion where I have the cylinders down there, that's just more of a logical representation of the persistence. Uh, it's not to suggest that those are individual database, the whole rock is a database. But then we said, you know what, that two tier system, we can do better than that. Let's do, uh, let's do three tiers, right? We decided that as a principle, it was much better to, to separate those different layers, right? So now we invented this middle tier and took all those business rules and plopped them right on top of there. But here we're still sharing the same storage engine. It's a little less bloated because it has, doesn't have all those business rules anymore. But why would we do this? Well, again, it's the network, but this time it got better. We got faster networks, higher capacities, lower latencies, and all of a sudden it was, you know, it was okay to you know, slap an HTTP interface on top of those business rules, right? Maybe sometimes TCP-based ones. So that was uh, becoming more the norm around that time. But also we can start to begin to identify some of those concerns that Henri was talking about in the top right there, right? It was very common that if you had a system like, that looked like this back then, that you actually had a very stateful system. It could have been session state management, it could have been some kind of affinity to, to your servers, what have you. You kind of had this stateful system. And with that, you kind of lose some of those resiliency patterns that, that you could have identified that Henri had mentioned. But we did achieve something here. We had a little bit more functional alignment. Not quite there yet. But as we can see, we kind of separated all those different layers uh, in this architecture. So raise your hand if you guys have seen or built something that looks like this, three tier systems, right? Everybody's built them? They're cool. <laughs> so again, we love our acts. We love breaking things down. And this time we decomposed our system around that middle tier. We took all those business rules for our domain and we started partitioning them, right? Um, that made us feel happy. That made us feel pretty cool. And now that we have separated our individual fruits into these different uh, components, we gained a little bit better functional alignment with that. And now for the first time, if we experience any kind of load or pressure on one of those domains there, say for example the Apple, we can just scale that thing up, right? So what would drive us to design a system that looked like this? Well, around that time, thought leaders like uh, Eric Evans suggested that if you built a system using domain-driven design, that that's one way to solve a big problem. In other words, if you took a big problem and decomposed it into smaller ones, that's one good way to solve it. So has anyone built a system that looked like this one with domain services, right? There's also an M word for it that people love. My uh, <laughs> uh, I'm guessing that we're all starting to, to see a theme, right? Where we keep breaking these things down. And this time, we took our ax and we went to town on that middle tier, right? But we didn't stop there. We also took out that, that bottom tier and started slicing that thing up as well. 
So we can start looking at more concerns there on the, on the upper right, right? Um, we've, uh, so with this system, we still have the same properties as the last system where we have functional alignment and scalability. But now it's gained better fault resiliency as well, right? The blast radius is a little bit smaller if one of those components or nodes were to go down. Also, we feel pretty cool about the polyglot aspect of our database tier because now we can make decisions, right? If we decided our apple should be better represented in a relational database, we can do that. Bananas could be object databases or document databases and our leafy green could be a graph if we wanted to. And here we're starting to see evidence of a CQRS based system as well. But as we design the system that looks like this, we begin to see patterns and differences of how we do reads and writes, um, specifically around the behavior when you put it and load, right? Um, and the shape of that data that's coming out. So for example, we might see that we have more reads than writes, and the manner that we persist that data is different than how we read it out. So again, we break up our system. We just love that X. And this time we broke up that database tier, that bottom tier, even more into many more separate uh, storage engines. Okay. So looking at this very complicated rock structure over here, we now see evidence of queries and commands and ledgers, aka event sourcing for, for the bigger buzzword there, and projections of that state. Um, and we may have actually solved one of those previous concerns that we were talking about earlier, namely the, the read and write concerns and the storage. But um, as we've progressed through this journey and all the different distributed systems that we've seen, one thing that we've noticed is that we always come up with new concerns every time we try to solve problems, right? Now the concern here is around consistency, something that Henri had alluded to earlier. So we've really reached the end of our journey to getting to the decentralized model, but have we really? Right? It just continues. We've seen this pattern that every time we solve problems, we just generate and introduce <coughs> new ones. And so acknowledging, acknowledging that, the fact that there's always going to be concerns, may be just as important as the journey itself. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Henri. Great. Thanks, Jason. So, as you kind of notice this as well, the, the, the journey has been great, right? You, you took the rock, right? You chiseled away. You got some nice um, hor horizontals and you addressed certain concerns. Then we reached that maximum of, of chipping away on it. Then we pivoted on that, no pun intended, is to uh, more vertical changes, right? Chipping away in the rock. And then we say, well, it's great. We've now addressed all the concerns and now we have this beautiful micro lith architecture, right? And what the challenge is, we've actually introduced one of the biggest problems back in, consistency. We haven't solved consistency. Because fundamentally, and we've done this in, in the data world for a long time, you have to address consistency, either um, XA transactions in the past, right, and confirming. But we, we want to move away from that because that creates scale issues. So, which is interesting because if you start thinking about just the replication or creating consistency between the different polyglot storages, um, you have to still address consistency, right? Meaning that at some point, everything has to see the, the data. And we solve this by saying it's eventually consistent. But we've actually seen that a lot of projects actually fail to accomplish this. And why they fail is because they, from a development or engineering perspective, they don't realize the things that are going on and what they have to do for compensation in this area. So this point, from a failure perspective, um, hopefully you guys remember this, okay? These are essentially the eight fallacies of distributed computing. You should never forget this. Um, so I've actually got a plaque uh, uh, hanging up and remind people of that. You should never forget this. It's beautiful to decompose things, right? But never forget this, right? Because it's always going to be true, right? So let's kind of walk through an example and what, what are some areas where you can kind of address this. So. You guys 
alluded, uh, Jacob kind of alluded already to one of the patterns, two key patterns, CQRS and event sourcing. Anybody familiar with these? Anybody implemented successfully? And everybody understood how it works? Touche. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight a couple of different things in here that you need to be aware of, right? Um, because fundamentally it uses an event sourcing pattern, right? So you're trying to similarize databases used to replicate data, like change data capture, uh, but now you're raising this to a higher level in your architecture, right? You're going from the fundamentals to a higher level of creating actual events, events or div domain events. That's fantastic, right? You got aggregates coming in. I've separated the, the writes from the reads, right? I, I make events out of these, and then I project it somewhere else. Simple enough, right? The problem is, is a complex system, if you have n number of items that you have to deal with, it be, the complexity goes up, right? If you then also combine the number of interactions that happen, another factor that goes up in your complexity. So actually, we've created a more complex system because if you put this um, and I love architecture because it's easy. You draw boxes and you're done and you walk away, right? But it's the instantiations that happen here. So take a look at the left. You see, if a simple example, and let's stick um, placing orders online for a minute, right? So orders are coming in. Um, you might just store it very easy in a transactional or ledger type of mechanism, no problem. But now you need to create events as well that then move over somewhere else. So you have n number of events that can then formulate an order status, right? Where is it at? Has it been filled in the marketplace or not? And you now need to create n number of projections. Well, that sounds easy again. But we've forgotten the, the fundamentals of latency again that I'm going to talk about here, here shortly. So what, do you, what things do you have to keep in mind to make sure that you, your system stays consistent through all the different projections that you have? So let's break it down. So let's think about consistency this way. So we're trying to have the left and the right being consistent with each other. So what things do I need to address to make that happen? First thing you have to recognize is LT, right? So LT is just the number of um, how long it takes to replicate the data, right? We've all known this in databases, but you have to now do the same thing in your system. If you use RabbitMQ, right, or any other queuing systems, there's a lag that happens, right? You need to factor that in because your developers that are writing the right-hand side, they say, well, hey, I never see the data, or there's a couple microseconds delay that creates a weird user experience. Now, if you're on Amazon and look at a shopping cart, let's, oh, yeah, it shows up in the shopping cart eventually. If you're a trading system and you don't see the order status, that's a little, you know, Okay, it's a different. You actually get calls <laughs> um, because you're not really about taking money. So you need to be aware of that as a developer on the right side that this is happening. Now, there's a way you can compensate for these things, either through um, um, making users aware, like it's eventually consistent. That's the easy one, right? Or you build in mechanisms that allow you to make sure that, say, hey, the status that you're reflecting is not as critical. If you need very high consistency, you don't allow the reads to happen, right? And there's different patterns for, for addressing these kind of things. But this is why a lot of the projects actually fail because this, comp this particular complexity. We forget about this. Another piece to keep in mind is the throughput or ban the bandwidth, the number of transactions you're throwing into. Um, do you think that by going in event sourcing mode, we get less events that we need to process? We get more. Right? So now you need components that are dealing with this bandwidth of events coming down the pike. You know, function as a service, yes, you can be idempotent and help, helps you in this area and scaling things up. That sounds good, right? You think, like, hey, just throw more stuff at it. Let, let the auto scaler kick in and, and pick up more. But wait a minute, what's the other thing we have to keep in mind with um, consistency? Sequential ordering. Darn, I just thought that solved the problem. But ordering is one of the hardest problems in distributed systems, right? You need to make sure that one comes before or after. Now, have we have systems in the world that can do this? Well, yeah. Think about TCP IP, right? It solves this problem. There's buffering capabilities. There's partitioning. So there's patterns in this area you can rely on to use. The other thing I, I want to say about this um, is um, when you actually start creating events, 
not a pattern I've seen very often. They say, you know what, we just, that's great. If I'm creating a write, and at the same time, I'll just send out an event, right? And it's all going to be hanky-dory. Well, then failures happen in between, right? So you might have done the write, you don't get an event. This is where you want to use systems like Kafka, Event Store, that they become first-class citizens so that on your write patterns, you don't have to be too concerned with the um, event sourcing part of the house, right? It's all about creating simpler frame frameworks in this particular area. Um, another key enabler, so I listed out a couple of enablers to kind of walk through, is you have to think about key enablers like single consumers, right? They talked about the sequential ordering. Right, you want to create sing singularity over there. You can still split things up, you might partition by account or whatever it is, but you need to design for this in your architecture. Uh, durable event store, I mentioned it as well. Data partitioning as well is another trick in the tools. You can actually avoid a lot of things by just partitioning your data. That, you know, this region only de deals with these clients, these region only with these clients. So you can avoid some of these um, constructs. Um, item potent keys, anybody heard of this before? Okay, it's, it's a great tool in the trick because a lot of times in failures, what happens with timeouts? What's the first thing that a developer does after you hit a timeout? Retry. So if I create an order to place $1,000 on Berkshire Hathaway and it fails and I place another one, what's gonna happen? I get an order for 2,000 now. If you looked at the latest stock, that's a, that's a lot of money. Um, so, Idempotent keys allows you to kind of indicate that, were, that you've seen the request before, right? But you use the same trick with event sourcing, that when the events flow through your system, you can tag them with an idempotent key so that if you've seen it before or if your processors are crashing, um, they can restart and rehydrate and see, okay, I've seen this event before, I can keep moving forward, right? Creates that scal scalability. Last but not least, um, this is one of the hardest semantics in distributed computing. Um, anybody implemented ex exactly one semantics before? Yeah, it was easy, right? Uh, it's one of the hardest things to accomplish. So it basically says that you exactly only once deliver the event and, and treat it. In the data world, that's one of the hardest things to accomplish. Even Kafka, um, you read Confluence, um, you know, they just fairly recently finally implemented exactly one semantics. And eyes wide open, if you really want to use this, it is a big price to pay in your, in your architecture, right? Because think about distributing that and trying to make sure that everybody sees the same thing. So eyes wide open before you actually do, do this. It's a challenging proposi proposition. So with that, let me kind of, a couple words uh, of wisdom um, or things to keep in mind per se. So even go, if you go down the event sourcing route, a couple of things you want to make sure you also do. Versioning of the main events. Um, schemas change, semantics change, right? Bake that in, right? You have to make sure you deal with that. Also ensure that you know that there might be multiple domain events in your system going on that I now need to create projections on. Again, they can be coming in at different times and there's probably not a talk we'll give at, a, at another venue where we talk more details, there's patterns for this particular piece and how to address, address this. And again, there's a lot of moving, moving parts to this. Make sure you do this for the right reason. Um, if somebody walks up to you, it's like, hey, we need to do CQRS event sourcing. First ask them like, why? Right? Uh, do, it for the right, do it for the right reasons. Right? There's other ways of solving the, the problems. Um, and there is no magical consistency solution. Um, if a database, database vendors might say, hey, we can create consistency. The problem is, like what I mentioned, is that you also have to deal with it at the application layer, right? You need to be aware that you're eventually consistent and compensate for when you're not consistent, right? When you have lag, it has to be a balance between the, between the two. So with that, um, we're two minutes last, but we'll be glad to kind of answer some questions. At least thank you for, for your time.